Okay, it is now um, 11.15, and so I resume the hearing. Um, and um, I said just before we broke, if I recall correctly, that I'd um, go um, across to the council, um, first of all, to let them finish off um, their point, and then so I would then go to um, Mrs. Cook. What, what was I dealing with? Good morning. Uh, ad adjustments for affordability and for... Student housing. Oh, you want to deal with those first? Okay, fine. Um, affordable housing need. Um, but, but, I mean, the, I think these are both these are both points that we did discuss previously. So I don't know how much you you want. But I, I, I was given to believe that you had that you had a point that you wanted to finish off. Well, oh no, no, I didn't. I, I, was, I was sort of working through demographics, market signals, employment, and then I think we've still got affordable housing need and students to deal with. So I was going to be moving on to affordable housing, but I think there's still points on the economic growth, possibly. Okay. Shall I leave that for now? Okay, fine. Um, so is this about the, the, um, the economic growth point, the, um, the getting from 650 jobs to the 790? It, it relates to that, sir. I'm not, I'm not taking a, a, a point uh, about the mechanics um, of getting from um, jobs to homes, but I'd like to draw your attention to some of the text in Chapter 3 of the um, CYC 43A, in other words, the, 20, the September 2020 document, and I'd invite you to, to, to pick it up, um, and in, in particular, in Chapter 3, uh, they say... We have not examined, this is 3.5, we have not examined the economic need associated with historic employment growth as the accommodation has already been provided to support that growth. Um, we've therefore focused on the economic-led need required to support the 650 jobs. And it's that first sentence in particular that I want to draw attention to and suggest to you that that uh, in itself uh, has not been demonstrated. And indeed, one of the, the points that everyone's making, and indeed the council themselves acknowledge uh, uh, this, is that we're in a situation where the affordability ratios are particularly high in York as compa compared to Yorkshire and Humber and indeed England. Um, th there is a history here of uh, affordability issues. And so it, one of the disadvantages, uh, and it's significant disadvantage, it seems to me, in applying this economically led um, approach um, is that they appear to sort of wipe the slate clean. And we know the slate isn't clean because we know that there is an acute shortage of housing and affordability issues. And you have to bear those points in mind when you, you look at the demographic approach and the rather cavalier way in which, and I understand why they're, what, why they're doing it, but t I would suggest it's, it's a rather cavalier approach for the council not to have followed through in this update and asked themselves what the appropriate adjustments ought to be in 2020 for the market signals, the household formation rates, just to sweep it away in one sentence by simply saying, well, the demographic uh, figure gives us a, a higher figure, I, I think is inadequate in the circumstances here um, in York. And I, you, you've, you've, you've now secured an answer to your question which is what is the starting point on the demographics. You've got table four. And I absolutely am with Mr. Robinson that you then need to make an adjustment for the household formation rates, which is what I understand the, uh, indeed, what GL Hearn are doing in the following tables um, in, in the paper. And then they in, need to make another adjustment for affordability. And we were suggesting, we are suggesting, that that ought to be 20%. Things that 
things have got worse, not better, since we last met. Thank you. I wonder if I might say, yet again, by adopting Mr Robinson, Miss Cook is making exactly the same errors that he is. The sentence she plucks out in isolation is dealing with historic employment growth. It's not dealing with demographics as such. As you already know, if you apply Mr. Robinson's 25%, I'll say it for the fifth time, you get a much lower adjustment if you take the correct starting point than if you apply the economic-led approach. And let us not forget, we have added 32 additional houses per annum to reflect the position from 2012 to 2017. So there has been an adjustment in any event for potential under provision given that we didn't actually have an OAN figure pre-2017. So I'm afraid Ms. Cook simply repeats Mr. Robinson's misunderstanding and his misapplication of the PPG. Mr. Good. Thank you, sir. Um, I think the misunderstandings referred to by Mr. Elvin seem to be quite common on this side, sir, because I also have those same misunderstandings, but I won't go there because we've, we've, we've discussed those on, on several occasions. Part of my issue with this, sir, is, is between the updated 2020 version of the housing needs and the previous iteration, in some ways it's like comparing apples and pears because we can't actually follow the same steps through to get to the same conclusion. So it's very difficult to ascertain actually what the full implications of the updated projections were. And I draw your attention to paragraph 3.6 as an example of this, of the 2020 version, sir, where it says, and it, it may be that Mr. Gardner can, can fill in some of the detail. It says, to arrive at the figure, several other assumptions have been made, and it does ref then refer to the part returns trend, but what other assumptions are those? Those aren't clearly defined in the document anywhere. If they are different to the ones in the 2018 version, does that create a problem? I don't know the answer to that because I don't know what those assumptions are. But it is very, and I'll use uh, the words of, of the former speaker, cavalier, just to throw a sentence like that in without any justification or clarification of what those other assumptions may be. Um, do you want me to reply? I, mean, just to, I suppose just in terms of perhaps of the first point that was made in terms of uh, not examined economic need associated with historic employment growth, the, the, the point we made there is at the time that 2020 report was written, ONS had published population estimates up to 2019, and therefore you can only really project forward from a point at which you've got, you've got data. So that, that, that was... Uh, it, it perhaps could have been worded better, but effectively that's what it's saying is, you know, the, the sort of projection part of the analysis is only from 2019 onwards because we've got a fixed, a fixed population point in 2019. Um, in, terms of an, in terms of assumptions, I think we need to bear in mind this September 2020 document was by its design meant to be a, a fairly brief review of do we think the 2018 projections change our view about the figure of 790. So it's not a detailed document. So I think if you want, um, the best place is probably to go back to the previous document that set out the 790, which was the January 2019 housing needs update. And I haven't scribbled what the reference document is. Just for clarity, that. that's the one that the council relies on, isn't it, in terms of that's, establishing the OAN? That's the one that gets the 790 figure. So the, so the document that followed back 2018 is really about, well, is about meaningful change, so it doesn't have the full methodology. Um, that you know, it does. It does set out key things within text, but in terms of that, I can I can confirm the methodology used is consistent with um, with that from from the 2019 document. In terms of economic growth, there's quite a quite a bit of detail from paragraph 3.5 onwards about about some of the assumptions used. Mr. Good. 
just, just very quickly, sir, and I think this possibly, I may, I may, may be wrong, possibly gets to the number of what the, the conversation's been about this morning. What we don't understand is, yes, I understand the 2016 and I, I followed the methodology and we made previous comments about that, which won't go over, sir. What we don't understand is how the 2018 projections have affected this 790 in terms of the economic projections. Where is the starting point for that? What starting point have we used? Now, I, I understand the conversation is born about table four and five, but we also say adjustments are made to those, which we then heard were not correct to make them at that stage. It seems we're having a bit of a circular, contradictory discussion here. And I'm, I, I was confused before I came, sir, but I'm actually slightly more confused now with the council's answer because, because we haven't had those steps laid out from the 2018 projections as we did with the 2016 ones, and I understand it was an update, but yet still we're told, don't worry, because they are the same and we will get to the same result. That doesn't seem to quite follow to me, sir. And if, if it is the same result, so be it. But what I don't see is that, that evidence in front of me or you, sir. Anything else the council wants to say on that? I will, I will only be repeating myself. Okay, is there anything that's, well, is in effect about section three of the 2020 update? Um, then does the council want to um, move on and complete um, the, the, the explanation? Okay, so I think the next thing we've got is, is around affordable housing need. Um, the source for an estimate of the need for affordable housing is in the original Schmar of June 2016, which, which concluded that there was uh, quite a significant need for affordable housing, 573 from, well, from 573 households a year. Um, but that report also clearly highlights the difficulty in trying to relate affordable housing need with overall need paragraph, from paragraph 6.94 of that document. And I think just to summarize some of the, some of the key points, um, affordable housing need, a lot of the households picked up as having an affordable need already live in accommodation. So if they were to be provided with different accommodation, a dwelling would be freed for use by another household. Um, if we actually look at the mechanics of the affordable needs modelling, the, probably the main component is newly forming households who do form part of the demographic projections anyway, so they're included. Um, and these are points that, that are also made, were made back at that time in a, in a planning advisory service guidance note, which you have referenced within there. So uh, the, the view is that whilst you know, effectively the council should seek to maximize delivery of affordable housing at every opportunity, but that, that, that in overall numbers terms, there is no direct, direct relationship between affordable housing and overall housing need. Um, we've put in a couple of um, legal cases as well that talk about meeting the full need for affordable housing or, or not needing to meet the full need for affordable housing. So I think that, that's sort of the summary where we are. I think we'd just like to pick up though on our approach to this because I note that Litchfields um, have suggested adding a further 10% on for affordable housing need. Um, and I think our view here is that, that again, that, that, you know, that in itself is not it's not necessarily an unreasonable thing to do, but it's a matter of applying it to the right, to the right figures. Um, if we went to, we did, a, we did a short addendum, and again, no idea what the, September 2017, housing need addendum, which I think was, an addendum was because um, a new set of projections came out as as the previous schma has been finished. So again, it was a short document just to see if there were any material changes. But that does just highlight that, um, that in paragraph 5.6, that the council could consider 
and we also use a figure of 10% for affordable housing over and above official projections, so over and above a demographic starting point. And I think if I go to Litchfield's matter statement, which I should have somewhere, their view, and it's paragraph 5.20, on page 36 of that matter statement. That's the appendix to the... Sorry, it's in the appendix, yeah. yes, you're correct. Paragraph 5.20, literally will say, with regard to affordable housing need, in the preparation of Schmars and determination of OAHN, it is proposed that where the total number of homes that would be necessary to meet affordable need is greater than the adjusted demographic-led OAHN, then a figure should be further uplifted by, well, should be uplifted by further 10%. Um, I think, from our point of view, we're not necessarily wholly disagreeing that, in principle, that further uplifts could be applied, but I think, as we've already noted, in going from a demographic position to a 790, we are already uplifting by quite sizable amounts, and therefore don't consider that something on top of that, again, is, is warranted particularly as in, I suppose, in demographic terms, the 790 figure, which matches the economic growth, going above that, 10%, um, and if it was as market-led, if it was a market-led development, you wouldn't, you know, you'd, you'd only be achieving a portion of that as affordable housing. And the evidence isn't pointing to that additional level of housing being needed to support the economic growth, for example. So I think there's a range of things around affordable housing that we don't, um, it said the link between affordable housing and overall housing is complex. A lot of households already live in accommodation or are included within projections. Um, I think where demographic need is quite low, as the 2018 projections for York relative to earlier projections are, there could be merit in adding something, but, but that, would be, that would be to a demographic position as, as I think Litchfields agree with in their own matter statement. So I think our position is we recognise the need for affordable housing, we recognise the need to do as much as we can to provide affordable housing, but we don't consider, given how far we've pushed the housing number up from a starting point or a demographic position, that there's any merit in, in doing anything further. No evidence of a need to do that. Can we then move on to students, please? Okay. Last we've, got, thing. we've got Litchfield's appendix deal with that. At Again, 38 onwards. Yes. Uh, okay. So I think a range of things around, around students. Um, the suggestions being made that, that the university or universities are expecting to see significant student growth and that this should be considered as in addition to the housing needs set out from demographic or economic based projections. Um, I think firstly of course that level of growth is uncertain. They're suggesting 4% a year. Um, it may be achieved but I'm, my, my guess is that it's, it's something that is going to be quite challenging and, and would need to be monitored anyway. However, I think more importantly, um, Litchfield's highlight that actually that level of growth has been seen in the past, and the extent to which it has been seen in the past, it is therefore captured by ONS within its trends, and those trends are then used to form projections moving forward. So although I would have some doubts about you know, whether, whether those growth figures are realistic, that's not really my, that's not really my case. I think my case is that 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 sort of level of growth is already captured within, within the projections. <clears throat> We've had it highlighted that um, work by Jill Hearn that I was involved in in Guildford did, did include a, an allowance for additional student growth, and that was in a situation where um, the future growth, A, was, was looked, you know, seemed pretty realistic, but also against the background where there had been limited growth in student numbers during the period in which house, during the period in which the population projections have been developed. So it seemed unlikely that population projections would be capturing 
past student growth as there hadn't been past student growth, and therefore moving forward, it was reasonable. But in the case of York, it looks like um, if that trend has happened in the past, that should be captured in projections, and therefore, and therefore again, there's no, no additional need arising from, from students. And uh, Mr. Gardner, if we just look at the conclusions to the Litchfield's approach about these adjustments, we've got 25% say for market signals, we've got 10% for affordability, and 4% for students, which I think is a, my maths would give me 39%. That's always a doubtful thing. Um, but that is still less than 157% uplift from the starting point that the economic figures generate. I haven't done that maths, but that sounds, that sounds about right. Yeah, the, 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 key is, the key is the correct starting point to which you're applying adjustments. Mr. Keogh. Thank you, sir. Just on the um, issue of uh, students um, and, and how the numbers are treated and what the implications of that is, uh, I've covered this in all my representations since 2018, and I haven't really got to the bottom of it, and, uh, uh, an explanation of how the council do treat student numbers. In terms of accounting for future growth, you heard yesterday from the vice chancellor of the university explaining how the employment projections allow for something, I, can't, I haven't got my notes with me from yesterday, but, but you will have them, I'm sure we can revisit them, but it was something in the region of 25 education-related jobs allowed for in the 650 figure, whereas in fact the university alone had generated something in the region of, I think it was around 600 figure over the last four years. So what we were seeing in the education sector was significant job growth related to the significant growth in the university itself. And as I set out yesterday, sir, all of the universities uh, and all the higher education institutions, University of York St. John, York College and Ascombe Bryan all have ambitions for growth. Uh, and I know that, sir, because we're acting for all of them. <laughs> and proposals, various proposals, we're looking at various proposals at the moment which should be coming forward in the next year or two. So they all have ambitions for growth, and you, and you heard firsthand yesterday the University of York's significant ambitions for growth. Uh, the major projects they're involved in, the collaborative international research projects, which could have major, you know, big implications for, for growth in student numbers and in employment at the university. If th there's a double whammy here, because um, if the student numbers are not being accounted for in the housing requirement. Well, they are being accounted for in completions. And this is a point that I've covered in some detail in my representations. And what that means, sir, is that uh, the housing completion figure is being artificially inflated by student completions but student completions are not properly accounted for in the housing requirement. Just to, uh, to give you the figures, uh, and, and this, is, this is quite an important issue also, of course, when it comes on to the issue of affordable housing, which I, I, I know I may be drifting into questions we're going, to, we're going to cover. But between the council's completion figures for 2012 to 2017, they include 731 student units in the completion figures. For 2012, sorry, for 2017 to 2020. My, they, my apologies, Mr. Kerr. What, what was that um, figure for 2012 to 2017? 2012 to 2017, the council's completion figures include 731 student units. For the period 2017 to 2020, the completion figures include 735 student units. That's 1,466 student units. 
In the last two years, there have been three major schemes that I know of. There may be more. I'm sure there are more, but I'll give you three big ones. Frederick House, the Mecca Bingo site, and last week, uh, a site at Alton Cars in James Street. The Alton Cars site last year, uh, sorry, last week, 303 units approved. The Mecca Bingo site, 275 student units approved. And Frederick House, the council are including 233 units from that site in their completion figures. So that amounts to roughly, uh, in my calculations, another 800, 800 completion units on top of the 1,466 already in the completion figures. So that's over three years of the housing requirement. It results in no affordable housing provision and it results in no section 106, meaningful section 106 provision. If, if I might interrupt, I'm, I'm having struggling to find where this is in a hearing statement. Yes, sir, it's in my, it's in paragraph 2.3.1 of uh, my uh, response on, on this matter. It's dealing with a general shortfall. It's not dealing with student accommodation. As I said, there so are some student units referred to, but that's about all it says. So I'm trying to. Uh, well, it, it, it does have a, an impact on the calculation of the housing requirement because it goes to the the figure of 32, the backlog of, of 32 units per annum, which the council are including as, uh, as a backlog figure for the period 2012 to 2017, because when you exclude the student units, that backlog almost doubles. If we can just hold that particular yeah. point, because um, when we're talking about the 32, we're talking about the housing requirement rather than the OAN, and I don't want any yeah. confusion between the two, because um, trouble lies therein. Um, are, are the, the, the particular figures um, that you've just given me, Mr. Keir, are, are they in your statement? The yes, yeah, so the the seven three one, the seven three five figures, the, the the backlog figure, the student unit completions for the periods uh, are in my statement. The figures I gave you for the recently approved schemes at Frederick House, the Mecca Bingo site, and the Alton Car site, they're not in my statement, so because they're they're more recent. But the, sorry, the, the 233 figure uh, on the Frederick House site is included in the Council's uh, housing monitoring report update dated May 2021. And the Council says, does it, that um, student need is included in the OAN, did I? Note that correctly. Student, um, yes, yeah, students are picked up in the OM because I think another thing that's pointed out in um, Litchfield's appendix on students is the way ONS works its projections is they hold. Um, the communal establishments for students at a constant rate, so therefore any additional students within projections will automatically fall into, into the housing need. So it's more a technical point rather than anything that we've particularly looked at, but it's because, because the communal is held constant, anything, any student growth above that will automatically go into the, effectively into the, the household population. We're certain, we're absolutely certain that we can, the, the yeah, student well, need is included in the OAN. If, yes, I mean, so if you look, if you went to figure six of Litchfield's <coughs> appendix on students, where they show, they show the projections flatline 
flatline communal establishments, therefore any students any students get picked up within within projections will automatically get will fall into into um, into the household population and therefore into households just in just in sort of methodological terms as much as anything. Whereas if for example if for example ONS were to keep a sort of constant communal population rather than an actual number, then some students would fall into the housing need and some would fall outside it. But because they keep it constant, they must all, by definition, fall into the housing need. All additional ones, that is. Okay, and there's one point that I wanted to pick up on, um, actually, from, from yesterday. Um, where we heard that, that sorry, this is um, unfortunately <laughs> um, going going back to um, the economic uplift. Um, and my apologies, I should have asked it earlier. Um, but yesterday we were told that the um, 650 jobs figure um, takes account of the effects of the university, um, but does not take account of the university itself, i.e. jobs created at the university. Um, so therefore, am I right in thinking that that 650 as it's translated through to the OAN that wouldn't include any need arising from the expansion of jobs at the universities themselves? And if, I am, if that is right, is it a problem? I'm, I'm not uh, having, I mean, I sat through yesterday's session, but having not been involved in the economic side, I'm not, I don't know if I can answer that. But what I will, I think what I will say from the sort of demographic point well, that, of view that's, is, that's what is I we've, heard, well, we've heard that the, 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 the university has seen that sort of level of job growth in the recent past. So in the same way as sort of students, um, that, that growth and, the, and, the, and anyone moving or living in the area taking up jobs will, will be captured within those trend-based projections already. So I think there's, there's that. Uh, you know, if, if 650 jobs is, you know, clearly if, if a number is higher, then that would have an impact on the housing. But then you've heard arguments that numbers are both high and, and low, so I, I can't, yeah, I don't, I don't know is the answer on, on the university growth. Can I come in on the back of that? Um, we also heard yesterday how the council was committing to further collaboration with the university and working on a statement of common ground to understand the implications of the growth. Um, so that will be understood as we move through that. And also to point out that we have um, identified um, an allocation to provide the University of York's expansion on site, um, ST27, um, that's made in the local plan, so provision is made on that basis. Um, yeah, um, I have to say we're a bit uncertain, a bit unclear on, on, on this point. Um, I, I don't know how significant or not um, it is, but if the 650 doesn't include um, new jobs created um, at the universities, um, I, I don't know what that, that might mean um, for, for the OAN and whether it would be a significant factor or not. Well, uh, <laughs> The issue is if you're looking at the, at the, um, either at the number of jobs or at the number of students, given that it's a, a longer term trend, as, as Ms. Gardner said, it'll already be reflected in the projections, in the, um, the ONS projections, and there's a, there's a risk you'll be going over the same ground again. It, it wasn't so much the students, it was the, um, because the 650 doesn't include um, the additional jobs that are projected to be created at the universities. But, 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 but anyone taking up accommodation in the past as a result of jobs being created at the university, which we're told is a trend and not just a, a new occurrence, the same position applies, they will be picked up in the ONS forecasts.
So, could I just come in on that point, just on the, the students and whether they're included? Yeah, Mr. Robinson. Sorry for putting in, but ju just on that point that Mr. Gardner made, I mean, he's right, obviously, the 2018 projections are trend-based, so there'll be an element of the student growth facts into that. But can I just take you to figure six of my appendix, which is on page 43 of my um, technical appendix on housing matters, because that shows you that the communal establishment hasn't changed, right? The communal establishment that Mr. Gardner was talking about, you would expect, that's, that's basically students living in student accommodation, so the way it works, they're stripped out of the, the population projections to calculate the household forecasts. So if Mr. Gardner was right, and that has been factored in, you would expect over time that the proportion of 18 to 23-year-olds living in New York in communal accommodation would increase because more of them are living in student digs. But this figure I've got here, it flatlines from 2011. So it's barely changed. It's still quite high at about two, well, just under 2,000. But essentially, it doesn't change from 2011 to 2013. 39. So given that we've heard that the university has got very, both universities have got very strong growth plans, we calculate around 10,000 extra full-time students over the, the rest of the plan period. You know, not all of those are going to be in student accommodation, but you know, if you take 55%, which is the, the rate that the council said we're living at the minute, if you have a half of that, you'd expect the communal population to increase by 5,000, and the 2018-based SMPP doesn't have that. Therefore, it can't have taken into account all the growth, and therefore, you need to be adding that on top of the OAM. In which case, we're back to Mr. Uh, Robinson's 4%, and I've already referred to that. Mr. Johnson. Thank you, sir. I think when I put my name plate up, it was more or less to make the same points made by Mr. Keogh, and I think it will, to some extent, come into the conversation when we look at supply. But listening to the debate right now, there is almost a case to actually take students into a separate topic area on both the need and the supply side, because the concerns I have uh, referenced by Mr. Keogh already is when you're looking back at the supply over previous years, student housing is actually quite dominant in that supply. And there is a concern is that the house prices are going up because the council are counting the student numbers and we're seeing a significant reduction in the number of family homes being built. And therefore, I think genuinely there is a case to look at students as a number and in the supply separately to the, to the rest of the um, housing requirement. Mr. Lane. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> I'm sort of surprised by the uh, answer given by the council in relation mm. to affordable housing. I think they're accepting that they're not going to meet the identified need for affordable units, not even attempting to by the looks of things, sir. I think the council have brushed it uh, under the carpet. The figures in my statement are quite clear insofar as they have massively failed to deliver anywhere near the identified need in the last uh, eight years or between the period of 2012 and 2020. And that's not going to be made any better by the allocations coming forward in the plan. Even on the council's own estimate, they consider that only 221 units will be delivered per annum against a need of 573. Um, in my view, sir, um, you know, the council should make every effort possible to meet the identified need, and they clearly haven't done so. Uh, and that's making the most disadvantaged in our society uh, worse off. Every, we've heard from Mr. Robinson and various other parties that every measure um, shows a worsening position of affordability, and therefore I think the council should strive harder 
to meet that identified need rather than uh, just brushing it under the carpet. And there are, as we will turn to in other sessions, many reasonable alternative sites throughout the district where additional allocations can be made and therefore boosting the number of affordable units provided. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. You're all planning experts and, and you, you're all arguing incredibly eloquently about what the exact numbers should be, but there's only one real number that's, um, that's relevant here, and that's that 573 affordable housing figure. And I was, to say I was disappointed by, the, um, by what I heard from the council's barrister, um, which was just a glib dismissal, frankly, <coughs> of the actual situation, that when you say we're not really going to address the affordable housing um, numbers, <coughs> excuse me, sir, <coughs> when you say we're not going to um, really try to address that, you're effectively saying we're dismissing a significant proportion of York's population. Whether that's those that can't afford to move out of a family home, whether it's those that are having to delay having children, whether it's those who are then saying, I'm about to be made homeless and I've been offered only bed and breakfast accommodation because there's nothing in the council's stock, which is what I hear on a day by day basis, sir. It's just a crass abdication of the responsibility of this plan and of the council. I do have one other question, though, in respect of the students, sir. I I'm not clear on, on, on what numbers um, the, the, the councillor are, are basing their uh, assumptions, and Mr Keogh um, certainly made reference of the fact that um, off-campus student accommodation um, is counted within the completion figures um, but not within the needs. Um, the housing monitor that, that um, Mr Keogh made reference to shows that since 2020 alone, we've had over a thousand consents granted for purpose-built student accommodation. And the impact of that is where, where is that accommodation going? It's going on brownfield sites. Those brownfield sites are then taking away from any opportunity for general needs housing. And if you take away from general needs housing, where do you put that affordable housing? Where do you put, the, where do you put any housing, frankly, um, other than student housing? And that's where we find ourselves. I sit on the planning committee, sir, um, and I see application, application after application of PBSA. I can't remember the last time we saw a general housing needs application coming through. Certainly the last three um, planning committees have all been exclusively PBSA. Um, and the impact of that is that there's nowhere on the brownfield, and, and, and I'm really struggling to see where on the brownfield, short of York Central, you're going to build general needs housing. And if the only housing that's going to be on York Central is going to be apartment blocks, where's the family housing? So that 573 figure is the only figure for me that has any relevance in the local plan. Where you end up beyond that is, 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 is for you to decide. But to dismiss the need of, for affordable housing, which I've just heard, um, is so disappointing. 
Sorry, if, could I ask, you, you, would you um, help me with where, if you met that 570 um, affordable dwellings a year um, need in full, where that would take your overall housing requirement? I think it'd certainly take it closer to the standard methodology. I think it'd take is, it a fair bit beyond. Which, which, is, which is 11, 1,200. Wouldn't it be nearer 2,000? Yeah, it may, I, I, sorry, I haven't done that calculation, mm. sir. I mean, um, if you, I mean, but it would certainly be a lot higher than seven, uh, 822. Yes, I think we can um, agree that. Markedly higher. And, but my argument is, it's the need of the people. You can, oh. you can argue the figures um, all you like, but what we have, and, and which, it's not unique to York, but it's specific to York, with its, with its size, with its demographic, is that we are excluding a significant proportion of the population. We've got a massive housing waiting list compared to the size of the population that we have, that we're not meeting their needs, and hostels just won't cut it. I understand the point you're making. Thank you. We aren't ignoring the affordable housing need. Mr Gardner and the councillor has misunderstood his own council's case. With respect, as Mr Gardner said, if we were doing the demographic adjustments, he doesn't take issue with the 10% adjustment that Litchfield suggests, but that's not the approach we've taken, as you know. And I've already made my reference to the comparison with the uplift from our approach and the 39% for market signals affordability in student housing, which if you add Mr. Robinson's figures together, you get. So it's not a case of ignoring the need. It's a question of how you translate that into the local plan. Okay. Um, yeah. Has everyone um, making a Mr. Robinson-esque argument said everything that they want to about OAN? Um, apparently not. Um, yeah, Mr. Sorry, I can't read you. Oh, Austin Fell, isn't it? It is. Yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, and I'll, I'll keep it brief. And it relates again to the topic of affordable housing that we've just referred to. Um, if I could take you, sirs, to paragraph 29 of the PPG, that tells us what uh, to do, what the council should be doing to calculate the total need for affordable housing, um, a topic which we understand has been done through the, the SHMA. The final sentence of that, sir, is helpful because we've been told already when we've had discussions on when we should be applying various uplifts uh, to the starting point. Um, and this sentence here tells us that the increase in the total housing figures included in the local plan should be considered where it can help deliver the required number of affordable homes. So this is almost once we've got to the end of that process. The paragraph itself is right at the end of that section of the PPG. Now, I think that's important because we need to follow those steps through as we've, we've heard this morning to consider what approach should be taken to affordable housing. The, the number we've already discussed is, is quite substantial. Um, what it would not be appropriate to do um, is, is to sort of try and meet that need in full. I think we're all in probably agreement that would explode the housing requirement. And indeed, I think it's the King's Lynn decision tells us that you don't need to meet the needs in full. Um, turning to what the council have said in this respect, we've also heard about um, double counting or purpur purported double counting here. And in the council's statement, this is paragraph 2.2, 
2.20, um, they, they talk about here about the economic-led adjustment and what that does to the overall OAN. And at the bottom here, they, they talk about it exceeding the demographic growth, um, addressing market signals and affordable housing need. Now, they're sort of somewhat conflating the two, and we're getting back into that double counting scenario. Um, and I'm not disputing that increasing the number won't increase affordable need. Clearly it will, and hopefully it will if they achieve their housing target. It's, it's whether or not that next step has been fully undertaken, and the council have considered whether a further uplift should be made. Um, like Mr. Robinson, we too are proposing a 10% uplift as a, a reasonable figure. We're not saying the need should be met in full, um, but we're saying that that in itself will allow a greater proportion of overall housing of which there will be an affordable element. So it goes some way to directly respond to that paragraph of the PPG. I have nothing to add to what I've said many times already. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I know what you will say anyway. I think I've said it at least six times now. Um, yeah, a anyone else on the point about the OAN um, arguing for um, a higher OAN? Um, can I just ask those people if they have said everything that they want to today? about the OAN before we go on to the requirement? We have substantially dealt with the requirement as well. Yes. Okay, in which case then, I will we'll look at the flip side of the coin, if I can put it that way. Um, uh, Mr. Corsia. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm a single voice here today, but I would remind you that probably the bulk of the representations you've had are arguing basically for less housing rather than more housing. And so I know that local people find very this sort of forum it's, it's not very intimidating. It's, it's not decided on a head count on the day. Absolutely, sir. Um, I, I have to say that as acting as a consultant at some of these, so I do aware how local residents do feel. So can I just pick up on the student point, first of all, before, before I lose that? Um, I think we did touch on this yesterday. You're comparing apples and pears, sir, and oh, you've been invited by some of the parties to do that. The 650 figure, sir, has been developed by an econometric model. It's an output from an econometric model. And, sir, I would invite you, if you have any doubts how it's been produced, to look at the um, Oxford Economics background paper at the back of the ELR. What it doesn't do is take into account decisions of individual firms, university, or universities, or whatever, sir. It is, as you've been, I think as the council have rightly said, it's based upon trends and future prospects for sectors. So decision of a, one individual, however large in the economy, sir, won't be necessarily reflected in those figures. However, sir, you have the university on one hand planning to expand, and as I pointed out to you yesterday, the army, who is a major employer in, the, in York, will be leaving York in, in, the tata, in their totality in the plan period. And that will be a major loss of population. And, sir, just going on the affordable housing point, that will release a large number of married quarters accommodation onto the York market, of the type that will be suitable for affordable housing. So what I'm saying is you can't add on the student, or you can't add on the university's growth aspirations. And so they are aspirations, they're not actually set in stone and they will and you will be inviting you to look at them in more detail at on the site specific sessions and I think the um, I think probably the council will as well um, you can't actually add those on to 
a figure produced from an econometric model. It just doesn't make any sense, sir. So just, and I would also remind you, sir, of the statement from the Vice Chancellor yesterday, where he said the intention was that the bulk of the new students would be housed in purpose-built accommodation, mostly on campus. So that, that was his clear statement, yes, if you, if you recall. So can I just go to the back then to where, where we started this morning? Um, the PPG, I think, is, I don't want to rehearse that again, what the PPG says, uh, other than draw your attention to one particular paragraph, which hasn't been referred to. Um, but obviously the PPG says you, first of all, you have to come to a household-based estimate of need. And that, and that should be initially, that should be, and again, it's paragraph 515, and that's been referred to about the household projections produced by ONS, provide the starting point. But then, sir, you then go on to the paragraph, which I don't think anybody's really quoted to you today, because I don't think it suits arguments, which the type of arguments have been presented to you, which is paragraph 17. which makes clear, which says the household projections produced by, well, it is produced by AONS now, are statistically robust and are based on nationally consistent assumptions. However, plan makers may consider sensitivity testing specific, and this is very important, sir, specific to their local circumstances based on alternative assumptions in relation to the underlying demographic projection household formation rates. And it says account should also be taken the recent demographic evidence, including the latest, latest ONS population estimates. But the key word, sir, is any local changes would need to be clearly explained and justified on the basis of established sources of robust evidence. And then they give you some exa two examples, both of which are changes in local circumstances. And so I would ask, invite you to read that quite carefully uh, at your own time. So, so we start, the starting point of course is, according to this, is the 2018, and because it, again, that is very clear from the PPG, you use the latest available set of projections which gives you a figure 302 dwellings per annum. And so can I just add in something, again, nobody has really referred to. We, of course, now have the interim 2020-based national projections for England. And they are producing a lower figure for England. We don't have anything broken down to local authorities yet, but that would be the control figure which would be used for any later projections at local authority level. So there will be no expectation I, that we will get a, the expectation would be you get a lower figure for York from anything that would be produced from that. So the figure which the council, the demographic estimate of need, I think, I'm not entirely certain from what was said, but I think the council are relying on this 669 figure which is, I think, found in um, 220, I think. But it's certainly found in Table 5, sir, which, of course, is based upon the 10-year migration rate. The alternative internal, which, is, which we're told by um, G.L. Hearn, is the progression of the um, past series will give you a figure based upon their part return to trend HA, HA, you know, the household representative rate of 598. 
So if I could take you, just have a look at table five, because again, we seem to be mixed up today what, what the inter in alternative internal and the 10 year migration projections, uh, variant projections might give you. So that obviously the 598 is substantially different, substantially lower. So GLH say to you, I think they're inviting you to say that you should use the demographic, that household based estimates and needs should be based upon the 10 year average. That's as I read the document. Um, migration. So rather than what they term as the ON use, ONS use of a two year average. And so my first starting point, the only justification for that, they say, is because the 10 year migration data is more robust. They give you no evidence about why that is a preferable assumption to use for York. So, and in, in effect, what GL Hearn are asking you to do is to invite you prefer their view of methodology to that of ONS. There's no local factors, no local evidence, sir, to base their use of the 10 year migration trend. Sir, so we do, um, if I could go on to internal moves, sir. Which, which is obviously the alternative internal, sir. Um, I don't think it's, it's a document we quote in our hearing statement. And I'd ask you to look at, it, at this document, sir, which is the methodology used to reduce the 2018 based subnational population projections for England, produced by ONS. It's page nine, sir. The reason the ONS has used the two-year figures, sir, and because the decision to use, if I could read the document, the decision to use two-year averages for internal migration was because analysis conducted by ONS showed the new methods used for the years ending mid-2017 and mid-2018 were more accurate and robust at picking up moves. So we're going to take a specific view on that, sir. And uh, again, the council has given you no evidence of any local conditions why you should depart from that. So this is a methodology argument, and you are, and I take you back to the PPG, which tells you you should only depart from the ONS projections, where you are given evidence specific. To, lo to local circumstances. And you have no evidence of that type for migration, sir. Yeah, in terms of international migration, sir, which has been the main driver of population change in York over the past 10 years, What, uh, what the council are, again, it's a disagreement with methodology, and I'll make that point, but they also, there is also a implication, sir, because of course, there were very high rates of international migration into the UK in the, up to 2017, 2016, 2017, and, and that is thereafter declined. So they're inviting you to use the rates and, which are heavily influenced by that earlier period. And so what you look at, what you see, the ONS are not projecting increases in international migration. And I give you the, again, I give you these figures in our hearing statement. Again, the interim 2020 based um, UK national projection shows a fall in net international migration into the UK from 232,000 up to 2026 to 205,000 from 2026 onwards. So what, what 
Gilla, what the council, Gilla Hearn, are inviting to do is actually saying York will take a, a much larger share of international migration in the future than it has in the past to sustain their levels. And that particularly applies, sir, if you apply the economic-led um, figure. And, sir, so I take you to again to household formation rates. Um, G.R. Hearn, I'm inviting you to accept that the household... Sorry, I'm finding this quite distracting. Somebody's talking in my ear, sir. Um, G.R. Hearn, I invite you to accept household formation rates, which produce about 40 to 60% more households than the ONS 2018 base rates. That's the massive uplift. So they are inviting you to adopt a household formation rate even in excess of the 2014 based projection used in the standard method. And so that again is on the basis of no local evidence to justify it. If you... It is simply, sir, an aspiration, but no evidence whatsoever that in the economic circumstances which you're going to be applying in the plan period, that aspiration can be met. And is simply, sir, inflating the housing need and potentially the housing requirement on top of what we're already told is a, I think the word used yesterday was an aspirational jobs growth figure. So you have aspiration based upon aspiration, which are, but in the case of the household formation rates, it is very substantial, sir. And without, this is all done, so without any, any, any of the types of evidence which the PPG says the council should produce to depart from the national projections. Sir. And just simply, sir, I won't deal with market signals. Again, that's, again, that's, I, I agree with the council, actually, on that point, the, a lot of the, there is double counting in the way in which you have been invited to treat them by the developer representatives. So, can I just deal with the, how you translate the 650 jobs to, into, um, into dwellings, sir? If I could just deal with that very, very briefly. Um. So, it, the... And I think, first, first of all, I'd, I, I'd ask you to look at commuting ratio. Think about the commuting ratios, which is a key part of what the council are inviting you to do. If, as we're told in the plan, that York is to fulfill its role as a key economic driver within both the Leeds city region and the York, North Yorkshire and East Riding LEP partnership area, sir, i.e. is going to be a focus for economic growth. One would expect there to be, that will mean it will be providing employment for an area well beyond the York administrative area. Indeed, sir, we already know that the York housing market, sir, extends well beyond the boundaries. And so that, that's in various documentation. And I would also draw your attention to figure 2.1 of the submitted plan, um, which again sh shows what York defines as the York's sub-area. And so the, 
there are, as, so you would expect in commuting to take place from other parts of the housing market area. You would expect it to be in commuting to take place from the travel to work area and to be increasing just because York will be playing that role as the focus for, growth, for employment growth of the, those areas. So keeping the 2011 ratio constant, sir, doesn't make a lot of sense in terms of what the economic aspirations of the plan are. And I would point out, sir, that Selby are planning, just as one example, sir, a 4,000 dwelling new settlement just on the other side of the York boundary in Eskrick, which will be in the housing market area and which will look to York for jobs. There is also prospects of other new settlements within the housing market area which are also being floated, but outside York. And sir, I would also, and I don't want to, working from home, sir, <laughs> will mean, and I don't want to take this at all, because we've discussed it a long lived yesterday, sir, but a lot of people who will have a notional workplace in York will not necessarily live in York, sir. For a very long time, I, I lived in York and had a notional workplace in central Manchester, in Manchester City Centre. Um, it is the way which modern ways are going. So you need to factor that in, sir. And you also need to factor in that very important figure, which I think I can't stress too much, that 19% of people in York and North Yorkshire work from home. Really critical figure, sir, when you're I, applying I, these I, statistics. I have that, that point um, very sir. clearly from yesterday. Yes, sir. And that's pre-pandemic, pre sir. And that point too. <laughs> right, sir. I think that's really the point I want to make, which is that the change I would emphasize back to you is that for you to be satisfied for departures from the ONS methodology, you have to be satisfied on the basis of local factors and local evidence. And this council has reduced almost none of that. And it is simply a matter of aspiration and basically GL, GL Helen saying they don't agree with it, ONS on their methodology. And that, sir, is not the basis which PPG allows these sorts of alterations to be made. Thank you. I suspect you're likely to pull us in an opposite direction, Mr. Robinson, so I'll, I'll go to the council. Okay, go on then. Well, the first point was could actually support the council because I don't think they've just Steady plucked. Steady on. <laughs> I wasn't going to say they, they, they haven't just plucked that 10-year migration scenario out of thin air. They haven't produced it themselves. I think they've got that from the ONS. Obviously, the ONS produced a series of, of databases and projections, so... I think it's entirely legitimate they use that, to be perfectly honest. Um, I do support them in, in doing that, so you know, we, we are on the same page on that. Um, the, the next point, can I just be very quick, and you can go to the council, but if you look at figure two on um, page four, which I think provides justification for moving away from the 2018 um, main scenario. So that, figure, figure two. Figure two of my proof, oh, sorry, my proof, my uh, hearing statement, which is page four. It's got a chart showing net international migration to the city of York. And what that shows, the trend one is the orange line if you've got it in colour, and that just shows you the net international migration over the last few my, years. My, my apologies. Um, of which document? Oh, sorry. Um, OAHN6, so it's my uh, Matter 2 housing need requirement paper. So what that shows is that net international migration has increased at very high levels in recent years, way above what was suggested by the 2018 projection. Actually, even in excess of the 10-year migration one. So if you look at that chart, 
it shows you for last year, because we've got the 2020 my, um, mid-year estimates. That shows us last year, there was a record high of 3,246 immigrants moved to York from abroad, compared to just 1,200 residents moving in direction. So that, that's a huge net increase of 